It's one of those you had to be there moment. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. I had to be there. Eric Donovan, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. How are you keeping, Jar? Yeah, good. How's the hand? Yeah, how, yeah it's, it's coming on. <laughs> Don't have to punch anymore, so I'm all right. <laughs> no rush with this. Come here, before we get into your, your had to be there, um, do you think you had to be there in Croke Park or would you be happy enough to be there in the three arena for Amanda Serrano and uh, the beating she's going to take from Katie Taylor? Ah, uh, yeah, it's a great question, to be honest. I think everybody has this kind of uh, romantic kind of connection to Crow Park and everything that it means and the history of it. Um, and I do think it would be really special in there. Um, I do hear your point, though. What if Crow Park is, you know, three quarters full? Would it have the same kind of atmosphere? I never thought about it like that. I actually I only kind of viewed it as being a full house. You know, when I have visions of Katie Taylor boxing in Crow Park, I I see a lot of people disappointed, uh, you know, for not getting tickets like, you know, and I've always said that I think Eddie Hearn underestimates the love for Katie Taylor in this country. And, um, you know, so I I would like to see maybe the bigger stadium um, and obviously like to see it full as well. It would be it really would be a disappointment if it wasn't. It'd be a generational moment, wouldn't it? Like Katie Taylor and Croke Park specifically. Yeah, you see, that's what I think that Katie Taylor has, which is kind of different to other world champion boxers, is that she has a a reach that goes right across to the families of across this country. Just families, you know, parents, kids, you know, where other world champions might just have the boxing fans or the hardcore sports sports fans um, but Katie just uh, she just connects to everybody and uh, I think it would be one of those um, family events a once in a lifetime yeah as you said a generational thing so I, I, I definitely would see her selling out Crow Park and I would be really shocked and surprised if she didn't Okay well in that case then like Eddie Hearn predicted people's response it was like just do it Eddie you know maybe he doesn't have to take his usual cut maybe he can give the money to the fighters <laughs> yeah you're dealing with one of the <laughs> toughest kind of prof- professional boxing promoters out there I know he's very very good um, but you know uh, he's a businessman at the end of the day and uh, you know I was quite quite surprised as well when I heard him speaking about the, the costs involved now I didn't look into it a whole lot much but it was just kind of like oh that was alarm bells for me you know it was like oh god are we ever going to, is this ever going to happen you know um, because I me personally I thought Katie Taylor has really reached the pinnacle she's done everything she's proved everything and I, I really don't even see the, the point in a rematch with Serrano like for what I think she could fill a stadium with boxing anybody you know um, well not saying anybody, but even somebody like respectable, like a mandatory challenger to her belts. Like she beat Serrano convincingly. Um, and she managed to overcome that obstacle. But Serrano is dangerous. She's very dangerous, you know. Uh, and what I mean by that is she's capable. We've seen it in those, I think it was the fourth, fifth and sixth round of that fight. We saw where she really shook Katie Taylor to the core of her, you know what I mean? And, uh, and th- so so that shows that she is capable of doing you know of causing a knockout you know and that would be a that would be an absolute disaster you know and yeah. that's just i don't i don't see why the need to go there again uh, they obviously feel the the money is enough to pay for the the level of risk um there's a lot to play out here and, and we'll obviously get an opportunity to talk about it again and if 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 it happens in the three arena then that will also be an incredible night I think the three arena has made your list of you had to be there let's get into them your first one is the preliminaries in the world junior championships it's Amir Khan versus your Danis Ugas of Cuba mm. so this is Amir Khan basically as a kid I, I suspect in 2004 yeah I was at these world junior championships and I was actually Irish senior champion at the time so I won the senior title at 18 uh, but I was still elig- eligible for the World Juniors and I was really expecting big things of myself because I had won the Four Nations Seniors as well as a 17-year-old. So I was vastly experienced at this age, you know, and I went out there and expecting really great things for myself and obviously it didn't go, didn't go to plan at all. But 
heard a lot of rumor about this kid from 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 England, Amir Khan. Um, but I haven't seen him yet. I just heard a lot about him. And um, so when we were there, we we're on this beautiful place, a volcanic kind of island off the south uh, South Korea. It's um, Jeju is the name of it. And uh, I remember the opening uh, preliminary rounds. We were, you know, we'd hang around with the English lads from time to time. You know, we'd be speaking to them and chatting away with them. We'd be fairly close to them and friendly with them. And um, Amir was there and... I thought he was quite cocky and a bit arrogant, you know, because the you, Jordanis Yugas, the Cuban absolute legend, was in the ring and he had come into this World Juniors as a world schoolboy champion. And he was probably, I don't think many, he, he'd many losses to his name at all. And he was absolutely exceptional. And we were watching him. Amir, Amir was standing with us and Amir knew he was boxing him next. And we were all kind of looking at Amir thinking, what does he think of this guy? Because he was, your mom was exceptional. But Amir turned to all of us and said, I'm going to stop him. <laughs> I'm going to stop him. And I was just like, you hear this lad, you know? And um, anyway, the next day they were due to face each other. He didn't stop him. But by God, did he give him some going over. He beat him, I think, 20, 21, 9 or something like that. And he was on the verge of stopping him. Didn't stop him, but beat him so so well convincingly and then that was the first time I ever seen Amir Khan in the flesh and I was really really taken aback full I was just like I was in awe of him and then later on after that he went he went on to win the gold um and word was that the English team weren't going to pick him for the Olympic qualifiers because he was too young I think he was only 70 and uh he threatened to go and represent Pakistan, his ancestral home. And um, then they changed their mind and they, and they picked him. And, well, you know what happened next. He went on and he qualified and won uh, uh, the Olympic silver medal at 17 years of age. And I just remember that I'll never forget that first time looking at him in the flesh, seeing him in the ring, just extraordinary. Uh, is that like... so? Kevin Caban talks about seeing uh, Robbie Keane in training and he obviously saw Wayne Rooney in training as well. Is it something similar where you're like, ooh, this is genuine world-class talent I'm seeing here? Because you, you must have felt like you were world-class yourself at that stage. I did. I'd look, I came up against, I was in the bantamweight division that time myself. I came up against a Cuban that was about six foot something in the bantamweight. It was absolutely incredible. But kind of unlucky with the draw. But yeah, like when, when you think about this guy that I'm here, like absolutely schooled, Jordanis Yugas, he's the last man to beat uh, Manny Pacquiao. Pacquiao retired after this fight. He went on to win the World Senior Championships in 2005 in China. He went on to win the Olympic bronze medal in Beijing. And he's a two times a professional world champion now. You know, he had a close fight with Errol Spence recently, but Errol Spence beat him. But like he is... You know, legend of the game, you know, top, top talent, Pan American, Central American, gold medalist, multiple times, World Cup champion. He's beat them all, but Amir just went through him, you know, and I seen Amir then go on to the, because I went to the Olympic qualifiers too. We were in the same qualifying tournaments and I just watched Amir just dazzle his way through it. Like his, his talent was just extraordinary. His speed, his hand speed, his footwork, he was just, you know, I give him my name for this. He was just lightning. <laughs> <laughs> and like you guess, uh, Eric, like his reputation probably preceded him. Is it the case when you're lining up against a Cuban boxer and you see that Cuban flag beside their name, is it kind of akin to maybe a sprinter seeing the Jamaican flag beside a competitor? Like there's something about the Cuban boxers that I'm sure causes a, a fighter to, to pause and think twice. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, when you see the Cubans coming into an arena or anything, everybody stops and looks at them, takes notice, you know. And what you will notice is that they are very, very, very together, very, you know, connected. And they don't pay much attention to anybody else. And they, it's almost like they know everybody is watching them. Everybody's looking at them. All the heads are turning. But they don't look... Uh, like they're interested in anybody else, just themselves, and they just carry on, you know, about their business. And um, 
you know, you'll hear, you know, people often talk about this before, like, you know, b- boxing the flag, you know, instead of boxing the, the man, you know, and the Russians and the Cubans and Ukrainians and that would have had really, really, really high, highly um, impressive reputations, you know, and you would have been, if you came up against one of them or got one of them in the draw, you would have been, the, your 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 first initial thought would have been, ah, Damn! Now I got to try and you know try and muster up the the courage and the know how to try and get through this test, like you know. But in, that's that would be the, the 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 first initial thought as soon as you get drawn against one of them. Ah, you know, and especially if it's your first fight in a in a tournament, you would feel a bit hard done by. Um, yeah. Your your next one is Paddy Barnes, and this is a, a gold medal fight. It's in Moscow. Funnily enough, you, you're talking about that. So, um, mm. was he up against a uh, Russian? Yeah, so Paddy Barnes is up against Elvin uh, Mamashadze from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. Now, incredible, yeah. absolutely incredible young fighter, um, major medal winner himself. Beat the beat a, beat a very good Russian. Um, it's not so much even the opponent, even though the opponent was brilliant. It was more about the display and the, and the gold medal winning performance because. I we came on to the Irish high performance team in two thousand and three. Gary Keegan was the kind of one of the brainchilds behind the whole program, and he was the f- the first director of it. Billy Walsh being the head coach, Zorantia, and we were all just kind of starting out in this in this new professional kind of um, setting. You know, we were all we were all boxers, but we were never we never classed ourselves as professional athletes. And I remember Gary Keegan saying that to us that. You are now professional athletes, you know, and we were trying to achieve something, you know, something really special. And they believed that, you know, world class, what did world class look like? They often spoke about that, you know, well, world class look like medals, you know, um, major medals, world, European and Olympic. And in 2002, the year before the high performance team was established, an Irish team went to the European Championships in, I think it was, Perm in Russia and I think nine boxers went out and nine boxers were eliminated in their first fight you know and uh, it was it was more about at, at those times it was go out and enjoy yourselves lads you know and have have to have the crack and enjoy it you know but the high performance was a whole new kind of um, new approach where we wanted to achieve, we wanted to get involved in the big fights and the big events. But I remember watching, uh, like I was at the European Championships in 2004, where we won nothing. Oh, sorry, Andy Lee got a bronze medal and he qualified for Athens, but he was the only one to, to get something and, and to qualify. Then 2006, the European Championships, we got a, we scraped another bronze. Kennedy Egan got that. 2008, don't think there was anything. Then 2010, and during these European Championships, I'm watching the Ukrainians, the Russians, and the Azerbaijanis, and the Turks. I'm watching all these guys dominate, and I never, it never, like, I never truly believe at that moment that you know what we're actually going to be a powerhouse or we're actually going to be on the top. Like, I just never thought that that would be somewhere we'd get to, you know. And then in 2010, we win five medals finished second to Russia in the European Championships. That's just an incredible, you know, rise. But it was Paddy Barnes' fight where I watched him winning that gold medal and I was just in the crowd and I was just thinking, wow, how only in a short, was seven years from the establishment of the high-performance team, here we have, you know, an Irish boxer finishing top on gold, the Ron Avine playing. And I was just like, wow, you know, it really made me believe that with hard work, like with hard work, belief, a supportive um, professional system in place and everybody, you know, in a kind of a coherent, cohesion kind of togetherness, you can achieve big things. And that opened the door to John Genevin, Michael Conlon, Jason Quigley, all within the, the subsequent years winning European gold medals. It's really incredible when you think about uh, when you lay it out as starkly as that to go from nothing to all those gold medals. It's not an accident. And Gary Keegan, who now obviously is on the sideline for the Irish rugby team this weekend, his influence in Irish sport, when that comes to be 
considered because he's actually brushed off against loads of other people along the way. I know mm. loads of people kind of go to him and have gone over the years. How how did you how did you do that? What what was it that transformed mm. this mess into this <clears throat> machine as it was? And yeah. um yeah, so next one on our list is Katie Taylor. Now you've gone for an exhibition fight, but this is kind of a seminal moment in the history of the sport as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a seismic real moment. It really is. Um, because of when you put the context, you know, in, when you talk about the context around it, Katie Taylor was invited to box on the finals, the final days of the world's men's boxing championships in 2007 in Chicago. I'll always remember Chicago for two things. I, I, I was, I boxed to qualify for the Beijing Olympics and I lost. You know, it was devastating. And it's always kind of a sour taste in my mouth because I genuinely believed I was going to do it. And I, I got beat by somebody I'd beat before. And anyway, that's the sour part. But the other part was I just felt there was a crowning moment for women's boxing. And that's when Katie Taylor got in to fight on the finals night at a kind of a, an, an interval moment. It was kind of a, a bit of an interval break at the halfway point. If if my mind serves me uh, right, if my memory serves me right, and she got into box um, a Canadian fighter, um, Katie Dunn. Katie Dunn, yes, uh, who is a Pan American gold medalist, Central American gold medalist, who's very vastly experienced as well, Jar. And when Katie Taylor got in, the whole place was just in in awe, you know, and she won. She stopped her opponent and she got a standing ovation in this arena. We were sitting beside the English team as well. And bear in mind that this English team was full of uh, a lot of superstars as well. James DeGaulle, world champion, Tony Jeffries, Olympic medalist, Billy Joe Saunders, world champion, Frankie Gavin, England's only ever world amateur champion. And they were all just turning to us. Wow, are you serious? Do you box her? Do you spar her? <laughs> they couldn't believe it. They really couldn't believe it. And if that was um, an opportunity to demonstrate that women belonged in the Olympic Games, then Katie Taylor just knocked it out of park. And I'll never, ever forget that performance. It's almost surprising that that was 2007 and there's Olympic Committee chiefs at the fight and they decide not to have women's boxing in Beijing. Now they finally mm. they finally cut themselves on and and uh, you know bring it in as a sport in in London twenty twelve. But considering the considering how impressive Kitty was on that night, it, it seems surprising to me that women's boxing wasn't in the Olympics four years previous. Yeah, yeah, probably I would agree with that. But I I think at the same time, even though Katie was exceptional there and she she really did. Um, plant a seed in all of those officials and delegates and you know to to really seriously consider having women's boxing in the game but don't forget it you know there was a there was a few special women around at the time but in terms of strength and depth mm. they probably didn't have it at you know across all the weights um and that's why they introduced the um only three weights into the London Olympic Games uh at the first attempt and then I think it's moved to five and now they're nearly on an equal level with the men's but um, yeah um, it was still still a, a, a massive challenge a massive task I, I believe that when she was in the dressing room as well before she went out that you know she was told that go and perform that the Olympic officials are watching you know and this is you know, can you imagine the pressure of that? I was going to say, it's like, yeah. whatever you do, don't screw up. It's like, oh, oh like, don't be nervous. What? Oh, now yeah. I am. Yeah. yeah, and you're already fighting on the world men's final, you know, where you kind of feel like, you know, men have dominated the sport of boxing for years, you know, and here you are boxing in front of your your peers, like, you know, who you would have been, you know, who you would have been looking up to, like, for a long time, you know, and you're getting into display or showcase your skills on this um on the stage, like it was a very daunting stage, I would have, uh, I thought, and uh, but she, uh, as I said, she just smashed it. Well, back full circle a little bit. Our next one is Bernard Dunn versus Ricardo Cordoba. It's the Point Theatre as it was then in two thousand and nine. It's the day that uh, Ireland win the Grand Slam. Liverpool, yeah. Liverpool beat Man United, or certainly Man United get beaten because 
Bernard Dunn famously says, oh, what a day, won the Grand Slam, Manx get beat, and now we're world champion. Uh, this is an incredible fight. The atmosphere is ridiculous. Yeah, ah, it's just unbelievable. It's, um, it's, there's no, honestly, um, I know that, I know it's a lot of boxing, but there's no greater um, atmosphere, I just find, than, than a world title fight that has all of the, the drama, the knockdowns, the, the storyline, the, the the narrative, it just keeps changing. And then everybody, the energy is just through the roof. And I think I think they showed the, the rugby on the big screen as well earlier in the day. I, I'm, t- I'm, I'm not sure if my memory serves me correct there, but I definitely think there was some connection. We knew about the rugby anyway as well, or the rugby was, sure, the rugby was earlier that day, yeah. Mm. Um and uh, so there was just a, just everybody was buzzing, you know. And then if you think of the story of Bernard Dunn getting knocked out by Kiko Martinez, um, I wasn't at that event, but um, uh, my some of my family members were. And I remember one of them saying when they were leaving, <clears throat> there was a guy coming up out of the bathroom, and a few of his mates, you know, he says to his mates, "Where are you going?" <laughs> they said, "We're going. It's over," you know. So. Um, and he was after missing it. So like just <laughs> that kind of, you know, to be absolutely just like European champion, then it just not, you know, taken away from you in the most dramatic fashion, like, you know, being knocked out, like really bad knockout too. Like, um, and then to turn it all around, keep chasing his, his dream and his goal and then to finally get there. Uh, and what a classic it was against Cordoba. Um, just, just incredible. And it was my first ever world title fight to be at. You know, and uh, I haven't been at too many big sporting events or major sporting events. Well, boxing mainly, but that was my first real big one. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was a hair standing on the back and neck moment. Yeah, it was a Brian Peters special. Yeah, He obviously is, it was Bernard's manager. He's, he's Katie Taylor's manager at the moment. And I remember, I think it was that fight, um, they got somebody else to come in and pretend they were Bernard and the... the Spotlight picked him out, and the crowd goes mad. And then Bernard comes out from to the Irish over from the other side of the state. And Cordova mm. was like, "What is this? Why am I in the ring for so long?" <laughs> but yeah. um, I, I, I mean, Cordova was uh, absolutely incredible in that fight as well. And Bernard had to climb off off the canvas. Yeah, he was. You know, he was just so he was some warrior. Like you know, and there was times there where you know Bernard Dunn had to really find something inside him like you know he had to dig deep down to the depths of his soul because there was time story where he 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 with he, like he with took like onslaughts from cordoba there was times where there was 10 12 unanswered punches 15 unanswered punches saved by the bell at one stage mm. it could have been stopped bernard could have been stopped the referee was the referee was that close to just really jumping in but the bell went you know that kind of stuff and uh you need um you need things to kind of, you need the rub of the green, you need things to go in your favour. And then it, I just feel it was, it was his time. It was his time. And uh, it was just amazing to be there to witness it. Yeah, probably the, the greatest fight on Irish soil there's ever been. I think it goes 11 rounds, but as you say, like Cordoba's dropped in the, in the third and then Dunn dropped twice in the fifth. So you think it's all over, but then ends up going six more rounds, which is which is incredible. Your last... Yeah, six yeah, six knockdowns, four for Dunn and two for Cordoba in the fight. Like, <laughs> just had everything. Had everything. Yeah, chaos. Uh, mm. Brilliant chaos. Your last picks, um, Eric, you've, we've paired a couple in uh, together here. Ryan Burnett and Carl Frampton, two of your former sparring partners, uh, Irish teammates as well, winning their respective world titles against Lee Haskins and Kiko Martinez. Yeah. Yeah, just look, I, again... Just because of the personal link with both of them, I didn't want to split them. I've been very, very close to both of them uh, throughout my career and sparred with them as well. But just two fascinating stories. Um, I remember Carl Frampton, you know, coming up loads of potential, but never really kind of ha- never got there. You know, he was not ma- mainly most of the time he was number two to David Oliver Joyce, you know. Um, <clears throat> and um, then things just changed for him. <clears throat> 2000. And- I think it was 2009, yeah. Things just changed for him, you know. He beat Davy Oliver and he went on. And, um, or sorry, 2007. He, uh, what's it, 2007? He won the, yeah, he won the European Union silver medal in Earl, uh, in Dublin. They were held there. He had a cracking fight with the French guy in the final. The French guy was, um, 
his surname is called Jakiev. He's a, he's an Algerian Frenchman and he won Olympic bra silver in Beijing. And Frampton had an absolute humdinger fight with him. And uh, it was Frampton's kind of coming of age fight. He did he didn't win it. Um but uh Barry McGuigan was there and Barry McGuigan saw you know that saw star quality, star potential, whatever, and then later on it was no surprise to realize that Frampton and, and um McGuigan's you know signed up a professional uh <clears throat> deal together and uh Ryan Burnett then as well failed a brain scan. He like he was just an incredible athlete, uh an incredible amateur boxer, Olympic junior champion and uh or youth Olympic champion, I think it was. I think he won a world junior medal as well and world junior silver medal and then he was turning professional and he always had his he always had his mind heart set on going professional but he failed a brain test uh brain scan and then he thought like oh god the whole thing is you know it's not going to happen and uh, then he went through a really tough time as well um i think starting out you know in terms of like if his story's brilliant um if you ever get talking to him, you know that he was living out of a car with his dad in England, try, driving around to the gyms, showering in different gyms, training in them, sparring different people, basically homeless, living out of a car. And then eventually he got his break, got his, signed up with Matchroom and Eddie Hearn, and um, he went on to, to to reach his destiny. Obviously, the brain scan got a second opinion and uh, got passed, and then he went on and. Uh, won his world title against Lee Haskins in the SSC Arena. Frampton won his world title against Martinez in front of 16,000 in the Titanic quarters. And I was in the crowd for both of them. And it was just nice to be there because there were two former sparring partners and they went on their journey and they reached the pinnacle and just an incredible backstory as well. Eric, this has been a brilliant episode of You Had To Be There. Thanks so much for sharing those memories with us. Pleasure. Take care. It's so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. I had to be there. That was class.